Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight on our Break Free from Pelvic Floor Disorders presentation. Before we start, Dr. Heiser, I just want to um, just do a, a quick introduction and just say to everyone that's attending, a welcome for attending this evening to our Pelvic Floor Disorder um, event. And I also want to just do a little bit of housekeeping. Housekeeping, Please mute your phones while all presentations are go happening. And you guys have the liberty to uh, be in different breakout rooms. And Dr. Heisler will talk more about that. And then also after the... Um, after the event is over, there will be a three or four question survey. We would appreciate if you could fill those out before you um, end, end your session this evening and help us better with all of our help, Healthy Women Community Talks. That's it. You got it, Dr. Heisler. Thank you. All right. Um, so again, welcome everyone. Um, we have been hosting this event annually, although virtually for the past couple of years. And it's our privilege to uh, bring forward the talent and the time of all the, our invited speakers and those who will be hosting the breakout sessions. Um, we can go to the next slide, Dr. McEachern. So as Cheryl highlighted, there's a couple just brief housekeeping and Zoom tips. So if you look at the black bar across the top, the first note is where you can mute or unmute. So we just wanted to remind everyone to remain muted during the presentations. Um, the video um, icon will allow you to be seen on the video. So you can either be seen or not be seen by pressing that little camera icon. Um, the participant note is just a list of the participants. If you wanna change your name, there's a note how to do that. Um, the fourth icon is the little chat, uh, chat bar. So if you wanna type a question into chat, that goes directly to the presenters. And I think Jackie and Cheryl are helping to man that. Um, so if you're comfortable just putting that chat in there, you can certainly um, note the question in there. And then if you want to ask your question, you just we just ask that you raise your hand. So that's the little hand icon. Just click on that and you'll get a little hand on your screen. And that'll be monitored by our, our team and we'll be able to answer your questions. Um, go ahead, next slide. So I wanted to introduce our speakers tonight. So I am Christine Heisler. Um, I am starting off with the introduction here and a couple intro slides. My partner, John Pennycuff is running a little late in clinic, but he should be here soon. And if I need to pick up um, because of that, I will, um, but he is gonna be joining us and we're excited for him to, to be here. Sarah McCachran is one of our urology colleagues and she's going to be speaking with us as well. And then Dana Hayden is one of our colorectal surgery colleagues. So you have an um, excellent multidisciplinary team. Um, next slide. It's important to note that we have the Women's Pelvic Wellness Clinic where the entire um, clinic is centered around the needs of the patient. Um, and this includes gastroenterology, colorectal surgery, urology, and then also urogynecology. Um, at the base of this is also pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, so we have this focus on the patient from the perspective of all of these different specialties, and it makes us very unique. We're the only program in Wisconsin and one of the few in the country that has this type of program. Um, what we're going to be covering tonight, um, we're going to start by just doing a cursory overview of pelvic floor disorders. Um, then we'll be talking about some specific conditions under that umbrella, including ladder control issues. Um, pelvic organ prolapse, bowel control issues. We'll also share some additional resources and then there'll be time for a Q&A before we do the breakout sessions. Oh, sorry. No, that's fine. Next slide. <laughs> um, so the first thing is our pop quiz. And if any of the, if any of the participants want to unmute for this, that's fine. So the pop quiz, as a woman, your chance of getting a pelvic floor disorders is A, one in three, B one and six or C one and nine. So is there, are there any bold participants that want to give an answer? One and six. That's a good guess. Anyone else? One I say three. one in three. Me too. So one we've got, three. yeah. And on the chat, we kind of vacillate mostly A, but a couple B's in there too. So Dr. McCachran, next slide, please. 
So pelvic floor disorders are incredibly common. And in fact, about one in three women will experience a pelvic floor disorder in her lifetime. Next slide. So a common question is what exactly is the pelvic floor? Well, the pelvic floor is a set of muscles, ligaments, and connective tissue in the lowest parts of the pelvis. It supports the internal organs such as the bladder, the uterus, the rectum, and the vagina, and it helps control pelvic functioning. So Dr. McEachern hit the side. So we can see that kind of gray bar across the bottom there. That's denoting where the pelvic floor would be. Next slide. Um, pelvic floor disorders are associated with problems with bladder and or bowel that's caused by a weakened pelvic floor and the connective tissues that support the pelvic floor. And there's an array of different symptoms that can be caused by pelvic floor disorders. Some patients may note some bladder leakage or bladder control issues where they have incontinence. They may have overactive bladder where they feel like they got to go all the time or they got to go um, right now. There may be also be difficulty emptying the bladder. So patients may feel like they're always um, full. Sometimes there's bowel leakage or bowel control issues. Sometimes there's elimination issues with bowel, which is constipation. There can also be vaginal symptoms such as pelvic pressure or a vaginal bulge. And there can also be some sexual issues. Next slide. So the next pop quiz, which of the following are risk factors for pelvic floor disorders? A, pregnancy, B, older age, C, being overweight, D, smoking, or E, all of the above. So in the in the chat, we're getting a lot of E's. Yeah, E. Yep, you're exactly right. Next slide. So there are a lot of different risk factors for pelvic floor disorders. The list on the left are the things that you have more control over. So lifestyle factors, I mean, smoking, just don't smoke. If you do smoke, try to quit. Don't start if you aren't. Um, be physically active. So we want you to be active, but not like an extreme athlete. Um, limit caffeine and excess fluid. So we do have a tendency in our, in our culture to overhydrate. So it's important to get the right amount of fluid. Avoid constipation, ideally not with extra fluids, as we just said, but using other medications. And then maintain good health. So keeping the pelvic floor healthy and controlling blood sugar if you have diabetes. Things that are less controllable include things associated with our life stages. So we know that the risk of pelvic floor disorders increase as we get older. We also know that pregnancy and childbirth are associated with pelvic floor disorders. And then there are certain health conditions like pelvic injury or having pelvic surgery. Also chronic lung diseases, which result in chronic coughing and some neurologic problems. So we know that the things we can control, it's good to maximize those things. And the things that are less controllable are risk factors to be aware of. Next slide. All right, Dr. McEachern. All right, I had to unmute myself. I'm gonna apologize. I have a, the slides up on an opposite screen. You're gonna see me looking a little to the side every now and then. Um, so my name's Sarah McEachern. I am in, in the Department of Urology, but my specialty is uh, either, you might hear us called female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery or urogynecology and reconstructive surgery. So um, as with Dr. Heisler and Dr. Pennycuff, we specialize in the treatment of urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. And I'm tasked with talking about urinary incontinence today which is the best one to talk about. Um, so here in the US, over 78 million women have urinary incontinence. So as Chris was saying, it is incredibly common. Um, and in fact, you know, estimated at 50% of women over the age of 50. Uh, so just a little bit about the basics here. Some people don't realize that the vagina and the urethra, which is the tube that urine comes out of, are actually separate openings. So we have a little animation here. This is a female pelvis sliced halfway down the middle. And what you're seeing here is the bladder. That's what's circled in purple. That's where urine is stored. And then when you get rid of it, it comes out through that tube that below called the urethra. The female urethra is about four centimeters long. And the urethral meatus is that bladder opening, which is just above the vaginal opening. So two separate spaces. 
a really brief introduction to how the bladder works. You can see from just even this relatively simple picture on the right that it's an incredibly complex process. And it involves having, it involves the front part of the brain, the back part of the brain, the entire spinal cord, the nerves that come off the spinal cord and the bladder, and all of those things to be functioning normally for you to be able to hold on to urine and then get rid of it when you want to. And so anytime there's an irritation or assault, insult to any anything in that pathway, you can see some bladder control problems. So your body stores urine in the bladder. We talk about, I tend to, to explain to my patients that the kidneys are the faucet and the bladder is the pitcher. So the kidneys determine how much urine is getting made. And sometimes when you take a diuretic, that faucet gets turned up really fast. And then the bladder is the pitcher. It's what's storing the fluid that's coming downstream. The bladder then, like we said, connects to a tube called the urethra. And there's different muscles and nerves that help, help determine whether you're in storage phase, so you're holding onto urine, or an emptying phase. You're in the bathroom in a socially acceptable place and emptying your bladder. And when you go, these muscles and nerves signal the bladder to push the urine out through the urethra. So one more quiz. Bladder control problems only occur in women after menopause. Is that true or false? And I can't see the chat, so I'll have people, if someone wants to shout out an answer. False. False, that uh -oh. is correct. It is false. Um, so while it is more common in older women, um, up to 38% of those aged over 80, that depends a little bit on how you define it, about one in four women aged 20 to 39 have problems with urinary incontinence. And some of the risk factors can be extra pressure placed on the pelvic floor. In this little cartoon down here um, on the far right of the screen, you can see the tiny little bladder getting squished by the giant baby head there, right? So pressure on the bladder, either from excess weight or from pregnancy. Constipation can cause problems with, uh, with urinary, can create a situation where there's urinary incontinence. And then probably sometimes for some folks, this is something that runs in the family. It's just something about your connective tissue that makes you more prone to developing urinary incontinence or pelvic floor disorders. One thing that we want to that we want to hammer home here is it, this isn't something you have to wait to talk to your doctor about. We know that a lot of women do wait to talk to their doctor about this problem, um, and over a quarter wait over five years to ask for help. Uh, but there are things that we can do uh, that you can work into your everyday life that can help with these issues. We tend to group incontinence uh, into kind of three big categories. Um, Stress incontinence, which has nothing to do with emotional stress, like you typically talk about it, but really mechanical stress or pressure being placed on the bladder leads to the urethra not having enough effort, enough resistance, and so some urine can leak out through that urethra tube. So stress incontinence is the kind of incontinence that happens when you cough or you sneeze or you laugh or you bend over or reach for something heavy, the kind of, and it's the kind of incontinence that happens with exercise. Urge incontinence, which falls into the, the larger term of overactive bladder, which includes urinary frequency, urinary urgency, and urge urinary incontinence, isn't related to that mechanical pressure on the bladder. Rather, it's the, the bladder squeezing and making you feel like you have to go and sometimes actually pushing some urine out uh, without any provocation at all. So you, you, you might have to go really often. You might have to go, oh my gosh, right now. Um, and when you do have to go right now, if some urine leaks out, that's that urge urinary incontinence. And some, this happens, uh, this frequency can happen during the day. This frequency can happen at night as well. And our fancy word for that is nocturia. And then there's other incontinence. About 25% of people will have stress incontinence. About, 25, or, uh, about a third of people will have stress incontinence. About a third will have urge. And about a third are the super lucky folks who have both urge and stress incontinence. So there's a fair number of people who, have, who fall into both categories. Continuous incontinence is, is not really unpredictable. That's a whole separate problem that we aren't gonna get into today. Um, so one more quiz question. Making changes to your diet may help you control your urinary incontinence, true or false? True. True. Any more trues? Yeah, I see some shaking heads in, of the folks that I can see. So yes, that is true. Just general lifestyle changes can help with some of these problems. Maintaining a healthy weight can help with both urge and stress incontinence. Limiting alcohol and caffeine, <coughs> excuse me, can certainly help with urge urinary incontinence. 
Um, we say avoiding excess fluid intake. What is excess fluid intake? If you're someone who has overactive bladder, that, that standard Oprah suggestion that you take, that you drink eight, eight ounce glasses a day might not be perfect for you because you're gonna have to go to the bathroom more often than other people. And avoiding constipation can help with urinary incontinence as well. Sometimes a really easy place to start is just keeping track, just keeping a diary. So track your intake, tracking your output and how often you go and seeing are there certain times or certain things that trigger issues for me. And then sometimes it's helpful for people to just schedule bathroom trips. If you're someone who finds that you, 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 you tend to postpone and postpone and postpone and postpone, and then all of a sudden it becomes really urgent, learning not to do that can be really helpful. We're gonna do a really broad overview of some of the treatment options that we have for urinary incontinence. Um, some of the, these include the lifestyle changes that we already discussed. Keeping a bladder diary is often a good first step. And there are some apps that you can look for on your phone that allow you to do this and track it a little bit more easily. Working with a pelvic floor physical therapist can help both urge and stress incontinence. And we'll hear from that team a little bit later. And then there's additional options for the different, the different types of incontinence because there often isn't one solution that just solves everything. And it's important to know that any treatment is going to need to be tailored specifically to you and your personal medical history, your surgical history, your social situation. And you know whatever works for your friend or sister might not be the same thing that's gonna be a great, the right solution for you. So overactive bladder, which is that urge urinary incontinence starts with just basic conservative management, working on some bladder training and urge suppression techniques, sometimes with our physical therapists, some behavioral and dietary changes can make a difference. There are all of the medications that you see advertised on television are for urge urinary incontinence. The gotta go, gotta go, gotta go right now medications or the cute little bladder that's leading the lady around. Those are all for urge urinary incontinence. And then what we call advanced treatments or next level treatments are all related to working, addressing the nervous system. So we can uh, have you come to the clinic and have an acupuncture needle placed in your ankle, but that acupuncture needle gets uh, hooked up to some electrical stimulation. That therapy done 30 minutes, once a week for 12 weeks, and then monthly thereafter helps a lot of people. We can inject Botox, the same Botox that people use here to make the wrinkles go away. We can inject into the wall of the bladder to help with urge urinary incontinence. And then we can implant uh, something kind of akin to a pacemaker also stimulating the nerve. And that's there's a picture of, of that device in the right corner there. For some folks, we have to do a combination of treatments. For stress incontinence, again, starting with conservative management, physical therapy, we can also use things placed in the vagina that put some pressure up against that urethra. You can think of it kind of like having a foot on the hose. And you can see in the picture down there, that's exactly what that pessary is doing. It's just creating some resistance by putting pressure on the tube. There are pessaries that you can buy over the counter. There are tampons that you can use for this and even just a regular tampon. Sometimes people find beneficial for this, pro for this problem. Um, uh, you can be fitted for the pessaries in the office as well. Some of the more advanced treatments include injecting substances into the wall of the urethra so that the tube that the urine comes out of gets more narrow and that wall gets more thick or the sling surgery that you've heard about is another option. And those can be done both with mesh and without mesh. And now we move on to Dr. Pennycuff, I believe, and pelvic organ prolapse. Yes, I'm just responding to the chat real quick. Um, the pessaries, um, so the, pes the question is, do pessaries interfere with menstruation, which I think is a great question. And um, it's, apropos because we're going to talk about pessaries as a, a management option for pelvic, pelvic organ prolapse. But to answer the question is, uh, pessaries can be removed at the time of menstruation, but they also have um, venting or um, areas that would allow for menstruation to come through if you kept them in during uh, menses. So they don't interfere. They have ways for um, your menstruation to pass through the pessary, but they can always be removed at the time of um, menstruation. So um, I am Dr. John Pennycuff. I'm one of the GYN trained urogynecologists, and uh, I'm so happy to be discussing pelvic organ prolapse with um, everyone on the chat tonight. Um, 
pelvic organ prolapse is sort of like, what exactly is that? You know, it may not be something you've heard before, or maybe you heard and weren't quite sure what it is. It's that feeling like something is falling out of the vaginal opening. Um, some people will say that their bladders have fallen or their rectum has fallen. Um, and it can be, you can kind of experience a vaginal bulb that you can see and feel, but you may also feel dullness or heaviness, um, kind of an achy back uh, sort of symptom. And it's very, very common up to half of women over 40 years of age will have some form of pelvic organ prolapse in their lifetime. Um, can I get the next slide, please? Wonderful, okay. So the pelvic organs include things like the bladder and the urethra, the uterus, cervix, and vagina, and the rectum. And they're held into place by ligaments, um, support tissue that supports the vagina. And that's also aided by the pelvic floor muscles that we talk about when uh, we say do your Kegel exercises. Those are the muscles that you're, you're activating and strengthening when you do your Kegel um, um, exercise. There's different types of pelvic organ prolapse. Um, when the bladder falls, uh, we call this a cystocele. When the rectum falls, we call it a rectocele. And sort of when the uterus is falling, we call that uterine prolapse. Um, when we talk about falling patients, a common question, which is a good question to ask is like, will it fall out to the point where it's like on the floor outside of my body? And the truth is, Prolapse can get quite advanced, but nothing will fall out. And what you're seeing is the vaginal tissue that's being pushed against by the bladder or the rectum. And it will definitely not fall out all the way, but it definitely impacts quality of life and, and you know, and functions like urinating, defecating, and sexual uh, function. Can I have next slide? So as I mentioned before, it's not uncommon for patients to sort of have pelvic pressure, heaviness, um, or discomfort. The patients may see uh, a bulging or, or, or something coming out of the vagina. Um, you may also, if you have pelvic organ prolapse, you may have, you may feel like you don't empty your bladder well, you kind of have a weak stream, it's difficult to get urination started. And the same true is true with bowel movements. You may find that you don't feel like you empty completely, that there's stool trapping. Uh, you don't feel, you feel like not everything got out. Sometimes patients will, um, um, even have uh, accidents because they haven't completely stooled. Um, and so um, it's, you know, some patients will kind of push in or around the vagina in order to urinate or, or in order to defecate. Um, and that's something we see with pelvic organ prolapse. So I think the first thing is when we see patients with pelvic organ prolapse, the first thing that they want to know is they see a bulge, they see a mass, and they think, oh my goodness, this has got to be cancer. This has got to be something really serious or dangerous that's like going to hurt me. And the truth is, pelvic organ prolapse is benign. It's not cancer. It's not going to kill you. It's It may get worse. It could certainly affect your quality of life. But if it's not bothering you and you're not symptomatic, we don't have to do anything about it. And so when we consider how we treat it, we need to know what your values are, what your goals of care are, and what you hope to get out of treatment. Because if it's not bothering you and you don't want treatment and you just want to know what's going on, then we don't need to move forward with any sort of active treatment. And then how we move forward with treatment is really dependent on the patient's goals and what they're looking for. So some patients with mild uh, to moderate prolapse who want a conservative uh, therapy might opt to have pelvic floor physical therapy to help strengthen the pelvic floor. And um, some patients, maybe if the prolapse is a little bit more severe or they're more bothered by it, but they definitely don't want surgery, they may um, opt for a pessary, which we saw can, are these sort of silicone, medical grade silicone apparatuses that are inserted into the vagina in much the same way that they support the urethra to treat incontinence. These uh, devices are going to support the vagina and the uterus and cervix to help kind of push things back into place and help with the symptoms of pelvic organ prolapse. Um, and then there are surgical options that are tailored to each patient's goals, severity, lifestyle, and things of that nature. Can I have the next slide? Wonderful. So whenever we're talking about surgery, what we want to do is restore function. We want to reduce the bulge and we want to improve quality of life. And I think it's really important um, to know that you're coming, you know, when you come to UW to see one of the surgeons, you're 
meeting with a fellowship trained doctor, someone who's gone and done extra training specifically to treat these sort of pelvic floor disorders. Because every person's situation, their prolapse, their goals, their symptoms is different. And so you need a surgeon who does a lot of these surgeries, that has a lot of experience, and then who can tailor that surgical management to what's going to be best for you and what you're looking to get out of surgery. You know, the way we do surgery depends on your body. It depends on maybe some other, uh, how bad your prolapse is. Um, it depends on maybe some medical comorbidities, right? We may not want to do a big invasive procedure if you have a lot of medical comorbidities that would put you at risk. If you have a lot of prior surgeries or you've, you've had a hysterectomy before, that influences how we make a surgical plan. And then, of course, as I mentioned, surgeon experience and training. And, you know, at UW, we're all fellowship trained. So we have a lot of experience, a lot of training, and that makes us really able to treat patients with pelvic organ prolapse. <laughs> um, okay. And I think this is really important. Um, success or failure of someone else's operation should not be the deciding factor for you. So I, what I think is wonderful is that more and more patients are talking about their experience with pelvic organ prolapse, surgery, treatment, but every patient's different. Every prolapse is a little bit different. Patient surgical or medical histories are different. And so I think that one of the nice things we're able to do is sit down and look at you holistically as a person and help guide the discussion on helping you choose the right surgery for you. All right, who's? Dr. Hayden, um, you're up next. Great. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, thank you so much for the um, opportunity to talk to all of you tonight. Um, this is really um, quite a pleasure. Um, I will be talking about um, basically um, trouble, talking about why people have trouble controlling um, kind of the backside or, or the stool, basically. Um, we can move ahead. Okay. It turns out bowel control issues are super common. It is a very common reason I see patients in the office. Um, and, you know, that's why I think there's certain personalities end up choosing colorectal surgery just because we have to make people feel comfortable about talking about things that they're, of course, so embarrassed about. Um, I talk about pooping in the office all day long. Um, so you should never feel ashamed to bring it up to your physician. And if you do, then that might just not be the right physician for you. So hopefully you find someone who you feel like a very, um, you know, open, you have open communication with. Um, and trouble controlling stools um, is super common and also can be um, related to a bunch of different problems. Um, and it turns out there's a whole spectrum of different treatments we have to help control people's um, problems in terms of like fecal incontinence or stool incontinence. Next slide. So here is another lovely diagram um, that is uh, showing what is involved in controlling our bowel movements. And there it is a whole, and what's actually missing from the picture is actually our brain and the entire spinal canal um, as well. So there's muscles and nerves um, and uh, the, uh, the rectum and anus that are all part of our continents. Um, and the anatomy is set up to basically help uh, allow us to control and hold onto our stools. The rectum is a reservoir. And then you should get the sensation that it's time to have a bowel movement. And this signal actually allows that rectum that is currently at rest at a sharp angle the nerves allow the pelvic floor muscles to actually relax and that straightens the rectum and then allows you to defecate. Um, so it is a lot of very um, sophisticated interplay between all of the organs, the muscles and the nerves that um, help us control um, our bowel movements and our gas. Next slide. So our... Um, fecal incontinence or basically lack of controlling our stools is again, a wide spectrum. And it can be someone, it may just be worried about passing gas and they're so upset about it. 
to just actually loss of gas or liquid stools or actually just having lack of control of solid stools. Um, there are other, the other side of this is that um, people who are having trouble passing their stools or have issues with constipation or difficulty defecating um, is also super common. And there's actually like a huge interplay between any sort of pelvic floor problem and bowel problem from basically loose, watery diarrhea all the way to harder stools that are difficult to get out. And all of this can take a chronic toll um, on our ability to control our stools. Next slide. So in terms of the first steps of trying to um, help our own um, bowel control, um, dietary changes are super important. So um, to bulk up your stools, increasing the fiber you take in the diet is really important. This can be done naturally, but it also can be um, done with adding supplements. Um, and this actually bulking up the stools with fiber actually can bring people both to like the norm of like less diarrhea, so thicker bowel movements or less constipation that actually bulks the stool up. Um, and this helps to allow people to completely evacuate, which is a super common problem. Um, to, um, it, in light of increasing all this fiber in your diet or with a supplement, you definitely want to also increase your fluids. So sometimes it is a little tricky if you have issues with the front side of the urine problem and you're not supposed to drink too much water, we definitely tell you to push your fluids. So there's a little bit of um, uh, uh, opposing incentives at times. Um, for um, fecal incontinence and trying to control um, our stools better, avoiding things that actually trigger diarrhea is helpful. Um, other things like caffeine or chocolate or alcohol actually can also worsen leakage. For constipation, again, just paying attention and avoiding foods that can trigger constipation. And some of these um, are actually helpful if you have, you know, are having diarrhea, we tell you to take these types of uh, types of food in your diet. However, they can also cause constipation and worsen symptoms if you're already tend to be a constipated person. Next slide. So besides um, dietary changes, there is a huge role of um, basically bowel retraining. And that is adjusting how people have bowel movements while they're sitting on the toilet. Um, and this can be done um, with or without a physical therapist. And this could be um, things like avoiding straining or lingering on the toilet, using a squatty potty or a step stool um, to help raise your knees. Um, but physical therapy is really one of our mainstays in any sort of bowel, um, bowel dysfunction that you can have, whether it's fecal incontinence or if it's trouble with constipation. And, um, and the physical therapists are really wonderful at helping retrain people to have um, better bowel movements, stronger muscles if their tone is weak, um, better um, coordination of their muscles um, if there is, you know, difficulty in like the muscles not really being coordinated with the nerves. Um, so, but these are specialized physical therapists. So um, they are just a, a huge, they play a huge role in treatment of these um, pelvic floor disorders. Medications, um, again, there's a whole bunch of stool softeners, laxatives, and anti-diarrheals. It is kind of important to understand the etiology of the trouble having ball or controlling ball movements because you can have just diarrhea all the time and have trouble controlling that. And then that there may be a role for, a, for an anti-diarrheal. But the other side of it, if you have constipation and difficulty um, getting ball movements out, you may have overflow incontinence when the liquid stool seeps around the more constipated stool, and then you have accidents with that liquid stool. And then thus actually adding a laxative may help you in that case. So um, it, there is a lot to tease out in terms of symptoms. And, and that's really um, where very thorough appointments in the office going over people's symptoms is really helpful. Next slide. So there are all sorts of, um, it turns out, rectal inserts, and I'm not very familiar with these because we tend not to um, advise these, but um, these are some sort of like soft, usually silicon type plugs that um, can safely be used. Um, and um, probably the urogynecologists do have a bit more um, uh, experience with these. Next slide. 
Um, and then again, these are um, vaginally assert, uh, inserted um, uh, devices that can kind of apply pressure through the vaginal wall to the rectum to kind of prevent passive leakage of stool. Next slide. Um, so when it comes to surgery, um, again, there we know that trouble controlling our stools is really caused by a, you know, a multitude of different reasons. And so it takes addressing all the different ways we treat incontinence, including surgery, like we have to really um, ad address all of the things. So doing a bowel control surgery up front first without addressing the underlying diarrhea is never gonna work. So we wanna make sure that we've maximized medical treatments as well as um, physical therapy and dietary changes. Um, and then we start looking at surgical options if those um, different uh, attempts haven't been fully successful, but they are very important. So um, we know that it does take a lot of different types of procedures and or treatment options to get people to um, continents and everyone has a subjective um, kind of uh, idea of how their incontinence affects their quality of life. So it is, a, there has to be a really open conversation about goals um, and like what the possibilities are. It is sometimes challenging to get patients to 100% control, but if we can improve people's quality of life, even with 50% improvement or 75, um, you know, those are, those are important things to discuss before any surgery. So we have a handful of different types of surgeries um, that we can do. Some are very minimally invasive and this are bulking agents where we can inject some hyaluronic acid into the anal canal to help with passive leakage of stool. Um, the neurostimulator, so it turns out the colorectal surgeons were real late to the game when it came to neurostimulation and we saw how well people were doing for the urinary side and there was an awesome side effect of having improved control um, on the bowel side. So we um, were about 20 years late to it, but now um, uh, sacral nerve stimulation is a very, very um, important uh, adjunct to our surgeries. And then sphincter repair, which can be performed in um, very specific candidates to help control their stools. Next slide. Okay, here's a pop quiz. I kind of love that. Um, is living with pelvic floor dis dysfunction a normal part of aging? Like, does everyone just have this and we have to accept it? Yes or no? That was the leading question. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so it looks like at least we have one no. And you can probably guess my answer to this. <laughs> Great. Okay, so it is not a normal part of aging. Um, there are a bunch of different reasons why people have pelvic floor dysfunction. It does take, kind of takes a village to kind of figure out exactly what um, led to the problem. Sometimes you don't ever get that answer, but we know it takes a bunch of different um, ways to treat this to get people feeling better, improving their quality of life. But we shouldn't just accept it as a normal thing that we all have to go through. Next slide. Okay, so um, just remember, I saw probably three incontinence patients in the office this morning. It's very common, and there's a lot of things we can do short of surgery, if that makes you nervous, and some really good surgical options for you. So please reach out, um, um, and I'm happy to take questions, I think, during the panel or the breakout. Ooh, is someone 90 years old, um, is it safe to do it or not to do surgery? I will do prolapse surgery on, on a handful of um, patients that have been over 92 over the last probably three or four months. So if the patient is deemed safe for surgery and we have a very clear goals of conversation, um, I am happy to operate on someone who is over 90 years old. 90 is the new 70. <laughs> Not sure who is up next. Dr. Heisler, are these the just the, our final slides before we go to our breakout sessions? Yeah, so this is a list of some resources that are available for folks if they want these, um, we can make them available. And then the next slide um, lists, um, we have, as I mentioned in the chat, our pelvic floor physical therapists in this community are just fantastic. 
Um, we actually have a lot of resources in different locations across the community where folks could uh, receive pelvic floor physical therapy. And we wanted to provide the contact information and the, um, and the links as well. Um, tonight, we are thrilled that we have three of our pelvic floor physical therapists from UW Health working with us um, on this presentation, and they're going to be um, facilitating one of the breakout sessions. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that we, we really are fortunate in this community to have such uh, an incredible partnership with our pelvic floor physical therapy team. And as I mentioned in the in the beginning of the presentation, um, our women's pelvic wellness program is um, is housed and um, utilizes the um, combined appointments with pelvic floor PT. Um, I'll take the next slide, Dr. McEachern. Thank you. So um, not everybody in our program is able to be here this evening. Um, some people have other clinical obligations. Um, and so I just wanted to show that we are just this amazing team. Um, the top right, that picture shows you the pelvic floor physical therapists that we work with at WPW. Um, and then the folks along the whole left side, those are our three fellows. So we have a fellowship program at UW and um, it's a three-year program. Uh, for GYN uh, trained residents that go into fellowship. And these are the three fellows um, that two of them will be joining us tonight. Um, and then the whole group of people in the middle section is all of my fabulous colleagues um, who uh, partner in caring for our patients. So this concludes our pelvic floor disorders event for the evening. Um, we are so grateful again for you to spend time with us tonight hoping to learn something about these very common but treatable conditions. Um, I took the liberty of putting some resources in the chat. So before the call is done tonight, if you want to grab some of those links, you can certainly do that. But Jackie and Cheryl mentioned they would be sending these to participants as well. So you'll have access to them. Um, so I just want to thank you again for your time this evening. And I want to wish everyone a good night. So thank you.